crisis in Ukraine is far from over. At least 20 people were injured in clashes between pro and anti-Russian protesters in Ukraine's strategic Crimea region, home to Russia's Black Sea naval fleet. One Russian national also died, but officials say the death was caused by a heart attack and was not related to the clashes. Furthermore, President Vladimir Putin has put Russian combat troops on high alert, the Kremlin's most powerful gesture yet after days of saber battling since its ally Viktor Yanukovych was toppled as president of Ukraine. In this edition of the debate, we'll break down developments there, including foreign interference, such as NATO saying it's ready to help Ukraine democratic reforms, while the U.S. said it is ready to help Ukraine hold fair presidential elections in May. This is Simferopol, the administrative center of Ukraine's autonomous republic of Crimea. Thousands of people demonstrated outside the regional parliament. Here, two groups pitted against each other. Majority Russian speakers who favor Russia and Muslim Crimean Tatars who back Ukraine's new Western-backed leadership. The rallies turned deadly at some point. One man died here. Officials say the death was caused by a heart attack and had nothing to do with the clashes. The rallies were held on the same day as the regional parliament was about to debate a split from the rest of Ukraine. Lawmakers from the Russian Liberal Democrat Party have visited the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. The same Russian members of parliament have called for a faster process to offer Russian citizenship to the Crimeans. Another senior Russian lawmaker has said that Moscow would welcome the idea if the Crimeans decided to join Russia. But Crimea's regional parliament says it won't discuss any partition. The ouster of Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych and formation of EU-leaning interim government has raised fears among majority Russian-speaking communities in the East that the Ukrainian language would replace Russian in their areas. I hope that Russia won't leave us alone at the end of the day. I'm a Crimean myself. I'm watching what's happening in western Ukraine. I want to tell you that I don't want my children on their knees as people have done in the West. I don't want to speak in Ukrainian. The events have alarmed Ukraine's eastern neighbor, Russia. Moscow says it's now concerned about the rise of neo-fascists across Ukraine. President Vladimir Putin has ordered sudden military exercises involving most of its units in western Russia, close to Ukraine. Moscow's plan for the snap drills have stoked fears of Russian boots on the ground as it happened back in 2008. That's when Russia sent its forces to Georgia after Tbilisi started attacking the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Kremlin, however, has ruled out any possibility of intervention. We confirmed our underlying position of non-interference in internal Ukrainian matters and expect that everybody will follow a similar logic. The Crimea Peninsula is a strategic region. Up until 1954, it belonged to Russia. But then USSR leader Nikita Khrushchev gave Crimea over to Ukraine. Crimea is home to Russia's Black Sea Fleet, a passageway to the Mediterranean waters. A look at Ukraine's ethnic borderlines can reveal how divided the country is. Its east and south, including the Crimean Peninsula, are Russophone and supportive of Russia, while its central and western parts, including the capital Kiev, are Ukrainian majority and want to join the European Union. Stakes are high. If the titanic tug of war over Ukraine's future direction keeps going on, the country, that's suffering an alien economy, would risk its territorial integrity with two parting halves. Well, let's find out if this is a tug of war there between the East and the West. Let me introduce our guest, former U.S. Senate Foreign Policy Analyst James Jotras, joins us from Washington. And we have a Ukraine affairs expert, Taras Kuzio, who joins us from Toronto. I'd like to welcome both of our guests. Let me get an idea of your stance, uh, stance regarding the situation, Taras Kuzio. Obviously not a dull moment in Ukraine. What's your reading into these clashes between pro and anti-Russian protesters in the Crimea region and, of course, the significance of this region? Well, your report was, was, was highly exaggerated that Ukraine would split. Where would it split? The Dnipro River? Where would it actually split? Countries don't split along linguistic lines. 
There's no ethnic or, or religious tension between Eastern and Western Ukrainians. And young Russian speakers, either in Kiev or in Donetsk or in Odessa, also support European integration. It's more a question of national identity and generation. The Crimea is different, but I think it's absolutely wrong and misplaced for your listeners to actually um, view some kind of breakaway region in East Ukraine. East Ukrainians are Ukrainians. They speak a different language, but um, Russian. But um, that doesn't mean say they're going to be separatists. In the Crimea, you have a different ball game. Uh, the region has an ethnic Russian majority. Um, it's an autonomous republic. It's recently added to Soviet Ukraine, then Ukraine. And there's obviously a very active Tatar minority, which detests ethnic Russians because um, half of the Tatar population was killed on the way to Siberia in 1944. Um, and so the, the tensions are high there. But Crimea is not the same as East Ukraine. And I think you are misleading viewers and listeners if you think the two are the same. Crimea will always, always different. Um, and um, it's not a question of Russia kind of coming in from the outside, as it were, to intervene. Um, the Black Sea Fleet is already in the Crimea. Uh, it doesn't need to come in from outside um, with uh, additional Russian troops. Uh, so uh, tensions will be there. Russian military and intelligence officers have always, um, for the last 20 years, supported separatist groups in the Crimea. And, um, and that is a, a potentially a dangerous focal point, yes. Um, but um, but um, this is not going to be matched in East Ukraine. Well, let's look at some of the statements, James the Trust, that are coming out from uh, Ukraine. The Ukrainian People's Deputy Party of Regions uh, has called on politicians to heed the people and stop inciting separatist sentiments, saying, quote, the breakup scenario won't work and the Crimea will remain part of the Ukrainian state. Are there politicians inciting separatist sentiments? Uh, I'm sure there are some politicians that are inciting separatist sentiments, and I understand this also includes some members of the Russian Duma. I don't think that is necessarily the position of the Russian government, uh, which I, I don't think wants to see a, uh, Ukraine become a major point of conflict and to take on a, uh, the, the, the air of a major East-West confrontation. I do agree with Dr. Cusio that, uh, you, that Crimea is very much different. That does not mean, however, that other parts of eastern and southern Ukraine are happy about what they see going on in Kiev, uh, even though they may not, and in fact, I think most of them do not, have much uh, love lost for uh, Mr. Yanukovych. I think they regard his removal as have been, having been illegal, and they don't necessarily subscribe to the legal authority of a government in, in Kiev that not only has not formed yet, has not been able to name a council of ministers or an actual government, but is not really even in control of the situation in Kiev, where we still have uh, armed groups on the street that uh, have, in essence, a veto power of whatever the new former opposition now calling itself a government decide to do. And uh, for example, the question of uh, presidential elections in May. Um, I don't know that they will be able to take place in the East and the South if uh, people there feel that this is uh, an illegitimate group that are trying to impose a new order on them against uh, the constitutional procedures. Well, uh, let's uh, get an idea, uh, Dr. Cusio, if we can, uh, from you about whether uh, Ukraine is stable enough, for example, for the presidential elections. I mean, you have here uh, this uh, interim uh, uh, authority uh, who is making decisions there in uh, Kiev. They're not entirely secure, are they? I mean, are we looking at a country that's on the road even to hold, for example, these uh, elections? Well, one of the demands of the Euromaidan was, was for a long time to hold preterm parliamentary and preterm presidential elections. And um, the, the date for the presidential have been held, um, have been put forward in 25th of May. I, I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic. I think um, it's, I'm actually surprised, I've always been surprised at how, how Ukrainians come out in large numbers to vote. This is partly the Soviet legacy. Um, and um, even though Ukrainian politicians are, are not really often worth voting for, uh, so I think that the elections will go ahead. The, the situation in Kiev is calm. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, secu the security forces, which are key here, are under the control of the 
interim administration legally if a president leaves office, i.e. he's killed in a car accident or he's incapacitated or he runs away, as in this occasion, um, uh, with Mr. Yanukovych, then legally and constitutionally, the Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament is the person who is the interim leader of the country until elections are held. So in that sense, uh, steps have been made. Um, the, uh, it was Yanukovych who fled. The Eastern Ukrainians, um, um, it, it's right to say, as, as we just heard, the East Ukrainians don't, um, particularly, well, less the young people do, but less the older generation and, and sort of party regions and communists certainly look at um, the new administration with a bit of um, worry and concern. I think that they exaggerate the nationalist sentiments there. But the... Um, but they're also um, in a bit of a quandary because the person they voted for um, and the party that they voted for, the party of and Yanukovych, is, is, uh, have been highly corrupt and have betrayed them or deserted them. So they, they are uh, wondering now what to do. Now, it depends which candidates are put forward. I mean, one of the leading candidates, Vitaly Klitschko, the international boxer, was very popular in Germany. Um, he has a lot of support in eastern and southern Ukraine. He's a Russian speaker by, by nature. And um, certainly um, he will be able to attract voters. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed and confusing picture. Again, I would still say that, yes, East Ukrainians on the whole are not very happy at developments in Kiev, um, but that still doesn't make them separatists and still makes them different from the Crimea. Nobody's against the country moving forward, uh, James Jatras, but uh, I mean, really, let's look at how quickly things are unfolding. I mean, it was just last week you had about, about 80 people who died, and here you have some major developments. Alarm in Ukraine, as some headlines are putting it, with Russia, uh, the, the troops being on alert for war games. And then you have uh, NATO and the U.S. coming out saying that we're going to help Ukraine uh, to go towards the democratic process. I mean, why, what's the rush here? And, of course, not to mention the aid that is being now whipped up uh, supposedly in talks with IMF. Well, that, I think, is a great part of the rush. Uh, the IMF, the uh, Western countries, have said they would like to help the new government as they understand it in Ukraine, but they have to have something stable and something responsible that will undertake the kind of reforms that uh, they insist uh, must take place for the money to be used properly. There are a number of problems with that. One is, um, I think it's very doubtful, frankly, they will come up with that much money. One of the problems uh, that, one of the things that kicked off off this problem in November was that the Europeans were uh, willing to put a lot of strings on Ukraine, but not a whole lot of money into the pot, whereas the Russians put a lot of money on the table and n n very little strings attached. I'm sorry, can you mention uh, some I, of those strings? I think strings? what we're going to see from the James IMF... Across, I apologize. Can you mention some of those sure. strings? Can you just give us some yeah. examples? The strings basically... Sure. The strings basically had to do with the restructuring of Ukraine's economy and also some of the conditions that the IMF was imposing. Uh, for example, uh, raising domestic energy uh, rates, uh, devaluing the uh, grivna, the currency, which of course has happened all by itself rather dramatically in the last few days. Uh, things that uh, have been characterized to uh, the doctors bleeding an already anemic patient. Uh, it's hard to see how in the short term this cannot help but trigger uh, an almost co complete collapse of the Ukrainian economy, uh, plus the fact that I, I'm sure we will hear, hear some very impressive number coming out of the West fairly soon, and very little of it will actually involve giving money to Ukraine to, to meet its commitments. Instead, there will be various kinds of um, uh, credits and things that Ukraine might be eligible for, but will not ex 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 directly result in money being given to Ukraine. It's very hard to see at this point how they're going to uh, stop the, what is now, uh, I think, a free fall of the economy. Well, I mean, uh, we're going around in circles here, Dr. Cusio, because, uh, you know, this is uh, something that's been discussed regarding, well, should Ukraine go to the uh, east and join the EU or should it uh, stick to its, uh, uh, you know, to its uh, friend there, Russia? I mean, uh, are Ukrainians actually educated enough in this case and informed enough, I should say, regarding which way they should go and make the right decision and shouldn't it be made at the ballot box anyways? Um, I'm laughing because I'm British um, and Britain's been a part of the European Union for the last <laughs> nearly 50 years and most Britons know nothing about the European Union. 
Um, the idea that you need to know something about an entity before you join, join it wouldn't work for probably most of the Europeans. Um, so um, I think this is, a, this is a different, depends how you look at it, from Kiev or Moscow. From the viewpoint of Kiev, um, the majority of Ukrainians, apart from um, Western Ukrainians, the majority of Ukrainians want to have good relations with Russia and want to integrate with Europe. That's the view of Ukrainians, that they can have both cakes and eat them at the same time. They don't see it as a, as a sort of a choice between Russia or Europe. Now, Vladimir Putin and the Russian leadership have a zero-sum game. They believe you're either with us or you're against us. So that's a very different view to, to the way of Ukrainians. And um, the... Um, so in that sense, um, the the, um, the in that sense, it, it, Ukraine is different um, to Russia. I think here it's not a question of um, of um, where um, Ukraine's going. The, the the majority of Ukrainians would, uh, especially uh, educated middle class younger people, would want to go towards Europe for the same reasons. And again, I say this because I'm not only British, but my mother's Italian. Same reason as Southern Europeans. Why are Southern Europeans, unlike, say, Northern Europeans, unlike Britons, in favor of European Union membership? Because they don't respect and they don't look upon in a good way their own central governments, whether it's Italians, Greeks, Romanians or Bulgarians. Whereas, you know, there is good governance in Scandinavia, Germany and Britain. And in the, in the same way as, as why Italians and Greeks would look to Brussels rather than Rome or Athens, it's the same reason for Ukrainians. They've had, they've had their politicians and their governments up to, up to as it were, to here, um, and they see um, Brussels as being able to uh, some way discipline and put some order into the rule of law, to fighting corruption and to reforms. And so um, that's, that's the reason uh, why uh -huh. Europe is a kind of a, it's a magnet for, for a, a post-Soviet future, shall we say. I'd like to break this open a little bit more. I uh, touched on it, James Jatras, and that is what Russia has uh, uh, announced through Putin, saying its troops are going to be on alert and there's going to be war games. And they've said that they're going to take every step to guarantee security of the Black Sea Fleet facilities in Ukraine. What kind of message is that sending, which is almost within the time frame of when NATO comes out and says we're going to help Ukraine, we're going to protect it, and of course saying that we're not going to interfere in its internal affairs? I, I think it's posturing. I think it's a way to say that the Western governments, uh, which Moscow believes have been interfering in Ukraine's internal affairs, to say, listen, we're still here, uh, we still have our interest here, and uh, if anything really bad happens, uh, we're going to take appropriate steps. I don't think anybody wants or expects those to happen. Uh, I, I think Russia's uh, position on uh, Ukraine and also Ukraine's relationship with the European Union is more moderate than uh, our other guest has suggested, that the zero-sum game, from my perspective, is really coming from Europe, not from Russia. Russia's point of view has always been, look, uh, Ukraine cannot afford to choose one path or the other. What's really necessary is to establish a better bilateral relationship between the EU and Russia in which Ukraine can find a proper place. That it's, it's unrealistic to ask Russia to expect that Ukraine would join a trade bloc, the, uh, the association agreement with Europe, but still have full access to the Russian market without reciprocation. That this would be a back door into Russia, not only for Ukraine, but for uh, European goods, that Russia would have no reciprocal rights. When the Russians object to this, that's called threats against Ukraine. I think if there's any hope of getting off the dime here and putting Ukraine back into a position where it can have a productive relationship both east and west, we really need to start an enhanced dialogue between Brussels and Moscow about what the relationship is between the customs union and the European Union. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, the topic of extremism, Dr. Kuzio. And Russia is saying that extremisms, uh, these extremists are actually imposing their will on Ukraine, whipping up religious tensions. Uh, and uh, the foreign ministry is saying that uh, priests and property of a church affiliated with the Moscow-based Russian Orthodox Church had actually uh, faced threats, warning that these tensions could actually uh, cause an even bigger schism in uh, Ukrainian society. Do you agree with that? No, not at all. I mean, you know, when Russia begins to lecture other countries like Ukraine about uh, democratic standards or about extremism, it's, it comes across as rather amusing. Um, after all, um, under Vladimir Putin, during the last sort of 14 years, 
um, extremism and Russian nationalism has come out completely into the open. And there's nothing in Ukraine comparable to the massive numbers of skinheads and, and fascist movements as you got inside Russia. In the case of Ukraine, I would ask um, your viewers and listeners just, just, to, just to do a, a Google search uh, of images of who actually is on the Maidan, who was on the Maidan. And you will see it's a very cross section of people. There are, of course, nationalist groups there, as there are many other groups. Um, but they don't represent the majority, and they don't have massive electoral support. In compared to most European countries, um, Germany is an exception here, um, but say Austria, where it's 30 percent, these nationalist populist forces in Ukraine have about 5 percent ele election support. That's less than France, Denmark, Switzerland, Austria, Sweden, and Finland, uh, and, and even Italy. So. Um, Yes, um, they, they were active. Yes, they um, were part of the, the Maidan. But the Maidan was a broad range of, of, uh, of, of different segments of society who were angry about, firstly, the cancellation of the European Association Agreement, but also about massive levels of graft and corruption under Yanukovych and just the way Ukrainians and the population general were treated. Just um, in terms of um, elections as that are coming up, the nationalist leader, Oleg Tsiagnobok, um, um, will have absolutely zero chance of becoming Ukrainian president. Again, that's different to, say, France or somewhere. Um, and, um, and therefore, I don't see them. Uh, this is more a problem that in the Soviet mindset that is very dominant among, say, some sections of Crimean society, but certainly in the okay. Russian leadership. i got to jump they, in. I'm they, sorry, since we're quickly running out of time here, I do apologize, Dr. Kuzio, to get a final statement from James Dutras. Some of these extremists, some of these nationalist movements, they were the armed part of this uh, uh, movement inside Maidan, for example, uh, and they are not affiliated with the opposition. They don't see politically. Do you think they're just going to uh, get pushed to the side? 30 seconds, no, please. No. No, no, no I don't. Uh, no, I don't. I agree with Dr. Cusio that that, that uh, you can overestimate the influence of those groups, but you can underestimate them too. They don't depend on electoral support. They depend on the threat of violence. This revolution, if that's what you want to call it, would not have succeeded if not for their repeatedly attacking the police with clubs, Molotov cocktails, and then firearms when the police were pulling back in accordance with an agreement with the political leaders. I think they're going to be continuing plague on the ability of the political leadership to form a new and hopefully more moderate uh, governance in Kiev. Thank you very much. We're going to end it there. Former U.S. Senate Foreign Policy Analyst James Dutras from Washington and Ukraine Affairs Expert Dr. Taras Kuzio talking to us from Toronto. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the debate from Ikova Tapway and the entire team in the capital, Tehran. It's goodbye.